going to read some words from the book of Hebrews and the chapter 10. Welcome everybody to the Lord's house this morning. We trust that you will know the Lord's help as we meet here and meet around the word of God. Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. And the writer then applying that great truth, he exhorts us in verse 19, knowing that we have boldness to enter in. Verse 22, let us draw near the true heart. We rejoice in sins and iniquities being put away, being forgiven and forgotten. Let us draw near in prayer and worship today unto our great God. We'll seek the Lord's face briefly in prayer for this. Our gracious Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege to come and to gather in the Lord's house this morning. And, O oh Lord, we thank thee that for thy people, our sins and iniquities, are put away, never to be remembered. Oh Lord, how great is the atoning work of Christ upon Calvary's cross. Lord, we pray then today that as we grasp something of the greatness of that truth, that we will indeed draw near. Help us in worship today. Help us to Magnify and honour our Lord's great name. And we pray that thou will be pleased to come to minister to us. We pray these things in our Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn in our hymn books, please. We're turning to the front of the hymn book, the Psalm section, Psalm 24. The Psalm 24 on the page 20. The earth belongs unto the Lord, and all that it contains, the world that is inhabited, and all that there remains. And it's the first six verses of the psalm that we are singing. So the words down to the end of the, down to the bottom of the page 20. So, Psalm 24, the verses 1 to 6. Thank you. 
will come before the Lord's face again in prayer, please. Let's seek the Lord's face. Ask the Lord for his help to be given today. And through this meeting we will know the Lord's blessings be our portion. Our gracious Father, we give thee thanks today. For the privilege that we do have to come and to seek thy holy face in prayer. And how, Lord, we thank thee that today, on account of God's grace, on account of Jesus Christ, we are able to climb, as it were, this hill of the Lord. We thank thee for him who truly had clean hands and a pure heart. There was absolutely no defilement found in him. And how, Lord, we rejoice today that as he, by right, ascended into thy most holy presence, that we approach thee today on his merit. We come as those who are declared to have clean hands and pure hearts as we stand in Christ. We thank thee that he is the means of our acceptance. And O oh Lord, we thank thee today that as we come to thee recognizing, even as the psalmist acknowledged in this psalm, that all creation belongs to thee. All things owe their existence to thee. We thank thee that we, the redeemed, are able to approach unto the great creator. And though we are created beings made of dust, yet we are able to draw right into thy presence as it was said of Abraham, we are said to be the friends of God. What a mercy. What great grace. And we pray today then that the wonder of the gospel will thrill our hearts as we continue in worship here today. O oh Lord, we pray that the great truths of redemption will truly strike us today and get hold of us. We pray, Lord, that as we come later to thy word, that we will know help in the meditation of it. And we pray today, dear Lord, that we will truly have an encounter with the Almighty God. And we thank thee for each one met in the meeting. Lord, you alone know the needs of every heart, we do commit thy people to thee. And we pray for those that are going through times of great stress, times of great trial. We pray, dear Lord, that thy people will know the sustaining and comforting hand of the Lord to be upon them. We pray, dear Lord, that thy people will be strengthened as we come to the word of God. We pray, Lord, for those that know infirmity of health. We pray, dear Lord, that thou will be pleased to put thy mighty hand upon them. And we pray, dear Lord, for those in our company today that are still strangers to thy grace, that still walk that road to everlasting destruction. And, O oh Lord, we do pray that even this evening, or this morning, that those that have come in who are outside of thee, that they will not go away as they have come in, but that thy Spirit will truly take the word and apply it, and the souls will be effectually drawn unto Christ. And we commit our children and young people to thee, and we do pray for thy preserving hand upon them in these days of great depravity. The devil is out to destroy them. Lord, we 
pray over their souls today. We cry to thee that thou will be pleased to save them and preserve them from all of the philosophies of this day. We pray that their minds will be saturated with the truth of the Word of God. We commend our nation to thee in all of its need. And Lord, we recognize that this is a, a nation that is ripe for judgment, a nation that is deserving of judgment. And we cry to thee, O Lord, that in wrath, that thou wilt remember mercy. We cry to thee, O Lord, that we will see times of gospel advancement as the Church of Christ is humbled and broken, looking on to thee for the mighty intervention of God. And Lord, we do cry to thee that we will see the Lord come again. O oh Lord, we pray that the church will turn from every message of accommodation and from every message of compromise. We pray, O oh Lord, that the preaching of the gospel will be restored to pulpits across our land afresh. And Lord, we cry to thee that as the gospel is proclaimed, sinners warned of their need, but presented with that message of grace in Christ, we pray that we will see multitudes being ushered into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And come today, we pray then, and graciously undertake for us in this season, we pray these things in our Lord's grace. We're going to turn again in our hymn books, please, to the words of the hymn 343. 343 is on the page 315. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness. Oh, 343, and we'll stand again to so we'll
we will turn please in God's word to the book of Genesis and the chapter 41. Genesis and the chapter 41. Last week we considered the dreams of the butler and the baker and how the butler was restored. And we saw in that a beautiful illustration of the gospel. That though we have defended God and sinned against God, yet as the butler came with the cup, uh, sinners come to God on the basis of the work of Christ. There is acceptance. At the end of chapter 40, we have verse 23. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. Chapter 41, verse 1. It came to pass at the end of two full years, the Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favoured kine, or cows, and fat flesh, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favoured and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favoured and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favoured and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. And so in this first dream, the seven skinny cows ate up the fat ones. Verse 5. And he slept and dreamed the second time. Behold, seven ears of corn came up, one upon stock, upon one stock, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. It came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, and there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. And then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night. I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream he did interpret. It came to pass as he interpreted to us, as it was, to me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it, and I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. Behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat-fleshed and well-favoured, and they fed in the meadow. Behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill-favoured and lean-fleshed, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill-favoured kind did eat up the first seven fat kind. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favoured as at the beginning. So I awoke, and I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk full of good. And behold, seven ears withered and thin, and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them, and the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, 
The dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. And then there, knowing the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. Again, I want to welcome everybody to the meeting this morning. Thank you all for coming to the Lord's house. And for those that are visiting, we give you a very special welcome in our Savior's name. And we trust that the Lord will draw near today and minister to all of our hearts. There will be Sunday school after uh, some refreshments at the end of the meeting. And then after Sunday school, uh, we will be having church lunch. And we invite you all to wait with us for the Sunday school as well as the uh, church lunch that follows. Tomorrow night, the men's prayer meeting at 7. And then uh, Wednesday evening, the prayer meeting and Bible study here at 7. And the meetings on Friday for the children and young people at the usual times. And then also on Friday, there's going to be an event over at McDonald Park, a food truck fiesta. And God willing, we'll be having a literature stand at that. Two have already volunteered to help with that. But if there's anyone else that would like to help on Friday evening, so that'll be from 5 until 7 or so. If you're able to help with that, we'd certainly appreciate uh, some help with that. I'll be here uh, for the children's meeting and the youth. And then on Saturday morning will be the ladies' Bible study. So the ladies' Bible study will be this incoming uh, Saturday. Uh, so there will be no outreach in the city on Saturday morning. It will be the ladies' Bible study here. And it will be in the mat, so if you can park in the car park and then you go up the steps, please, to the mat. That will be at 10. I think the time's not in the bullet. So the ladies' Bible study will be at 10 on Saturday morning. And then services next Lord's Day at the usual times. God willing, I'll be here to minister next Lord's Day. Being the first Lord's Day of the month, uh, next Lord's Day will be the Lord's table in the morning time. I think these are all the announcements and they are made subject to our Lord's precious will. We're going to turn again in our hymn books and as we sing this time, the offering for God's work will be received. We're turning to the hymn 300. And 51, 351, when peace like a river, sorry, 410, I'm looking at tonight, so sorry, 310, thank you, 410, 410, I'll get it right yet, 410, hark my soul, it is the Lord, it is thy Saviour, hear his word, 410, page 342. And we'll remain seated at the beginning of 410. <laughs>
just the verse 6 and we'll stand. <laughs> Chief Butler remember Joseph. 
He was told to remember. He didn't. And so then we have in chapter 41, verse 9, after two years, they spake the chief butler up to Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. And so God's remembrance is perfect. God is faithful. But in contrast, man is unfaithful. Man has, from the fall, a memory problem. And when I speak of man's memory problem, I'm speaking especially of man's problem in remembering spiritual things. And of course, memory loss on the wider scale is a consequence of the fall. Remember how in Romans chapter 8, and that chapter describes the great downward spiral that there is in creation. Creation is under this bondage of corruption. And we are to expect then that things will get worse, not better. And people spend much energy trying to make the world a better place. And well, physically, the world will continue to degrade. There will be an increasing problem with genetics. Of course, there are also environmental factors that contribute to memory loss. But the fall of man has affected every part of our being. Our wills are affected by the fall. Our conscience has been affected by the fall. Our memory has been affected by the fall. And so prior to the fall, Adam and Eve had perfect capacity in their memory. Imagine being able to recall everything that you've ever seen, everything that you had ever read. That has never been known since the fall. And so with the fall, in relation to memory, there has been a loss of capacity. We don't remember everything. Some of us remember very little. There's a loss of integrity in the memory as well. In that we tend to remember the wrong things. And so if we see something vile and foul, we have no trouble remembering that. In fact, we battle to forget it. When someone wrongs us, we have no trouble remembering that. But when it comes to the things that are good, when it comes to the things that are honourable, so often we struggle to remember. And in particular, we are forgetful of the things of the Lord. Jeremiah 2.32, the prophet says, Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? And when a young woman Forget her jewelry. Would a, a lady that is married forget what her wedding dress looked like? And surely the question is being asked to say we would be surprised if that was the case. The Lord speaking through the prophet then says in Jeremiah 2.32 Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. And my people have forgotten me, days without number. How could there be such forgetfulness? And yet, this forgetfulness is not just something that we occasionally see. It's not something that is occasionally experienced by God's people, but it happens frequently. There is a frequent forgetting of the Lord. And surely every Christian, if we're honest before God today, we know this to be true in our own hearts. There's that forgetfulness which is demonstrated in prayerlessness. There's that forgetfulness that is demonstrated in laying aside the Word of God. There's that forgetfulness Perhaps it's, uh, that's demonstrated when we come to pray and our prayers are just requests. And we are not filled with thankfulness unto God. 
It ought not to be so. Last week I showed you that the restoration that the butler experienced, the restoration to service, is a great reminder of grace. And so you and I were created to serve God. Sin caused us instead to serve the devil. What has grace done? For those that have experienced grace, grace has restored us to the service of the Lord. We come before God on the basis of what Christ has done for us. And yet so often we're like the public. We read this account and we say, how could he have been so forgetful? And yet so often we are guilty of the very thing that the butler was guilty of. He went on for two years in forgetfulness. We may live for longer than two years in forgetfulness of God's great grace. Today I want us to come and consider this great confession in verse 9. Where the butler said unto Pharaoh, I do remember my faults this day. He confessed his forgetfulness. I want to see first of all the accuracy in this confession. The accuracy in this confession. He said, I do remember my faults this day. Now the Hebrew word that's translated faults here is a word that we talked about last Lord's Day, where at the beginning of the previous chapter, it is translated as offended. That is, the butler and the beggar, they offended Pharaoh. And I explained to you last Lord's Day, that that is actually one of the words for sin. Fallen short. So they failed to come up to Pharaoh's standard. What is sin? Man does not reach God's standard. And here we have another way in which this word for sin then can be translated. Fault. Fault. Sin is guilt before a holy God. And the butler here is not so much speaking about his faults before the imprisonment. But he's speaking about the fault since he was restored. I confess my fault. I have forgotten about Joseph. I have not told you about Joseph. I do remember my faults this day. And so the words of the butler are really a remembrance in his mind of the very thing that Joseph had said to him. So when Joseph gave him the interp interpretation of the dream, you're going to be restored to your fathership, Joseph had said, make mention of me. Remember me to Pharaoh. Think of me. Remember me. He had failed to do that. Now, why had Joseph made that request back in chapter 40, verse 14? Some condemned Joseph for saying those words to the butler. And they suggest that Joseph was becoming a little bit frustrated and he was trying in desperation and even in manipulation to have the fulfillment of his dream. I don't believe that's the case at all. What Joseph was doing here was making use of means that God had ordained. And he was a man that was going back to the palace and Joseph was making use of the means. Present my case before Pharaoh. I have been wronged. I should not be here. So if we're to fault Joseph for saying, tell the king about me, that would be to fault the Christian that was out preaching the gospel. We know that God had ordained his time for when Joseph was to be brought before Pharaoh. But Joseph didn't know the time. We know that God has ordained that sinners will believe. We don't know who will believe or when they will believe. Our duty is to make use of God's appointed means. And that's exactly what Joseph was doing here. And in fact, God honoured him for doing so. 
And so the butler did not tell in the time frame that Joseph had thought. But those words that Joseph had said, remember me before the king. Two years later, the butler did remember them. He did bring them before the king. But coming back to this matter then, Joseph said, remember me, the butler had not. It all comes fully now back into his mind. He says, I'm at fault. I have sinned. He was at fault for Joseph. He had forgotten the one that showed kindness. He was at fault before the king. Surely during that two year period, Pharaoh was in need of wisdom that he could have been in need of Joseph during that time. Butler at fault of the king and not speaking about Joseph. In that way, he was at fault before the whole nation. What I want to emphasize here is that the butler says, I remember my thoughts. And so he doesn't say, I remember your fault, Pharaoh. Or I remember the fault, so. Anyone in my service? No, he says, I remember my fault. There are no excuses here. He confesses freely the fault and the guilt is mine. No longer any cover up. And often we're not good at that. When there's fault, even if we take a little bit of ownership, we're always wanting to divert the blame off to others. But the butler led the blame where the blame was. I am at fault this day. Now, how many there are even who are in the wrong place spiritually? And they want to blame everybody else. They want to blame the preacher. They want to blame people in their family. Others in the house of God. Uh, those people may indeed have their faults, and they do. But ultimately, if you're not in the right place before the Lord, the fault is yours. It's time to own the fault and get before the Lord and cry to Him for mercy that there will be a putting right in your Christian life. The Lord knows that we are prone to forget Him. You think of the fourth commandment, remember how it is stated in Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And now why is that verb remember used? Why is, why is it not just keep the Sabbath day? Surely the way it's worded is emphasizing that the Lord knew that when the commandment was given, God's people would be prone. To forget it. And therefore the need to be reminded. To remember it. If you turn with me then to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy and the chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. And we have here uh, a reflection as well upon the Ten Commandments. And so the same Ten Commandments are listed. But sometimes there's a slight variation in the wording and that's true concerning the fourth commandment so Deuteronomy chapter 5 and the verse 12 it says there keep Sabbath day sanctify it and so the word remember is not used here in this verse but rather it's keep observe it put a hedge around it the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God have commanded thee. And the same argument that was used in Exodus 20 is used. Verse 13, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And remember, that argument was built on the creation argument. So God created everything in six days. The seventh day was a day of rest. God did not need to rest. God was setting a pattern for man. Man needs a day of rest. The Sabbath was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath. And so then there are to these six days of labor, a day of rest, 
And if you look with me then, verse 15. And remember, if I was the servant in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand. Remember, that was the servant. And so though in verse 12 the word remember is not used, the word remember is not forgotten. Why were God's people to keep the Sabbath day of the Old Testament? And what was to motivate them to remember to keep it? They were to remember their slavery. So they were to remember the pattern in creation. And that is showing us that the commandment is showing an example for all time, not just for the Old Testament period. But God's people in the Old Testament then were in particular to remember that they had been in bondage in Egypt. The Lord had taken them out. The Lord had not left them in that slavery. And if you know the book of Deuteronomy, this is one of the things, the theme of remembrance. Four times in the book we have these words. Remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt. Remember your slavery. And the words then come. I redeemed. You were redeemed. You were set free. Now what's the lesson that we can draw for, from that for ourselves today? And some speak of how we are to remember our history. And we are to look back and remember great things that the Lord has done in our history. Times when this nation and others were brought as it were to their knees. They were about to be about to be destroyed. The Lord intervened. Remember the Lord's intervention in your history. And we are to take lessons from history. Otherwise, of course, we are doomed to repeat the errors of history. But chiefly, this relates to us in the area of redemption. God's people were in slavery in Egypt. And we are to remember that we were slaves to sin. To sin. God's people were set free through the shed blood and the application of that blood. The shed blood of the Lamb. We have been set free through the shedding of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Set free. We are then to remember. Remember his day. Remember the things of the Lord in general. When the children of Israel came to Sinai, remember after the Ten Commandments were given, Moses was still up the mountain. Remember they came and they said to Aaron, make us gods. Aaron formed the golden calf. The psalmist speaking about that in Psalm 106, 21 says they forgot, they forgot God, their Savior. What an awful thing. To be brought out of Egypt. To be so miraculously delivered at the Red Sea. And they soon forgot God. How could it be? And yet their sin is ours. We're quick to forget God. We see that theme of remembrance in the Sabbath day. We see the theme of remembrance in the table. Remember the Lord said concerning the Lord's Supper. This do in remembrance of me. But why are we to have the table? Because we are so prone to forget. The Lord has given us the table that we might be continuously then in remembrance. So here the butler said, I remember my faults. May it be so today that we remember our faults. That we remember our forgetfulness. And I want to emphasize that these faults were the faults that came after his restoration to service. 
I'm taking the illustration then that I used last week. These faults are not so much speaking about the faults of our unconverted days. These faults are speaking of our faults after conversion. The faults of the butler prior to his imprisonment, when he offended the king, they led to imprisonment. So by our very nature, we were in bondage. But we've been restored to service of our great king. So praise God, the faults that come after our conversion, they do not put us back into prison again. But they do affect our fellowship with the Lord. They do affect our usefulness for God. Here we can take this comforting thought that while we have been at fault, the King of glory has not cast us off. He continues to draw us, He continues to hold on to us. And while we see here then our folly, let us take hold of grace fresh. So there's the accuracy in this confession. I want to see then, secondly, the circumstances that led to the confession. Why was it that the butler and I said, I remember my thoughts? But surely, first of all, he encountered a man with the same condition that he had previously. He encountered a man with the same condition that he had previously. That is, he came to hear about Pharaoh who had a dream, a very disturbing dream, two dreams in fact, very disturbing dreams, but he didn't know the meaning. He was very sure that there was a meaning, but he didn't know what it was. And the butler then remembered that he had been in that similar situation where he had a very disturbing dream, but he didn't know the meaning. But then also, he encountered a man whom the world could not help. And so here was Pharaoh. He was in this dilemma. But none could help him. He called the wisest, supposedly, he called the wisest in the kingdom, the king's advisors, the king's magicians. I'm sure there were the priests of the false religions of Egypt that were called. Not one could help. Maybe even the butler, before he had spoken to Joseph, had talked to others and none could help him. But certainly the butler knew that none in the palace was able to help Pharaoh. What will bring a change in us in relation to forgetfulness is if we see today what the butler saw that day. You see, isn't part of our forgetfulness Demonstrated an unconcern for those that are lost. But what is one of the great demonstrations of forgetfulness among Christians today? Is that there's so little evangelism. The fact that we have so little concern for the ungodly is a demonstration that we have forgotten the greatness of God's grace toward us. If the message of grace truly thrilled our heart, then we would want to tell others. If what the butler had experienced really thrilled his heart, that he'd been brought out of prison, restored to service, if that really had grabbed hold of his heart, he would have told others about it. The fact that he was silent is really showing us that he was indifferent to something that was not a matter of indifference. So what is going to change us? Well, 
that we encounter lost souls all around us and get hold of this, that they are in a situation that was ours prior to our conversion, that they are lost in need of the gospel. If we see that the world cannot help them, they will run to this one and that one for help. They will turn maybe to false religion, works religion. They will turn to philosophers and psychologists. But ultimately, what they need is the Lord's help. We are to see that. No that our eyes would be opened to see the need of those around. The butler had been guilty of great ingratitude. And when Spurgeon preached on this particular thing, he spoke of Jesus Christ being our friend. Remember how he is the friend of publicans and sinners. And Spurgeon was saying that though the interaction between the butler and Joseph may have been short, we don't know how long that was. Certainly there was a period of time that Joseph had served the butler. But Joseph had proved himself to be a friend to the butler. The butler was ungrateful as far as that friendship was concerned. And as Jesus Christ has been to us the friend of sinners. How often we have been forgetful. And ultimately... It is not just seeing the loss that will restore us to remembrance. We must get a fresh sight of Calvary. It's the cross that ultimately is what motivates us. That truly shows us our state. Surely this day as the butler stood before Pharaoh and said, I remember my faults. He now remembers again the dream and dream will come. That presentation of the cross as it were is before him afresh. May we be drawn to see Calvary afresh. It was the circumstances then that led to the confession. And I want to see finally the sincerity demonstrated in the confession. In verse 9, then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. When the butler spoke these words, he didn't just walk out of Pharaoh's presence and go back about his daily business. But the butler put the matter right. He began to talk to Pharaoh about Joseph he was supposed to do two years before. You see, very often Christians can be challenged in meetings. They can be challenged in their reading of God's Word. And they may even say with the butler, I do remember my faults this day. And they make that confession. But they go away from the meeting, or they go away from their time spent with God in secret, and nothing has changed. There's a problem then with the sincerity of the confession, isn't there? When is sincerity demonstrated? When we actually put right the things that we've been wrong in. And so if it's a matter that is brought to our attention that is our fault, then the sincerity will be demonstrated in putting it right. May we today be brought to remembrance. And I've been thinking especially today of God's people. But isn't unthankfulness, isn't forgetfulness one of the great sins of the unconverted? And Paul mentioned that in Romans chapter 1. That those that turn to idolatry, they are guilty of unthankfulness. 
They worship part of God's creation instead of the Creator. They become vain in their imaginations. The sinner is unthankful. The sinner is forgetful. But isn't it good that we can come back to where I began this message? That God remembers. God remembers. God remembers His covenant. God remembers His promises. In Psalm 77, there's a series of rhetorical questions from verse 7 to verse 9. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will He be favorable no more? Is His mercy clean gone forever? Doth His promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Be in anger, shut up his tender mercies. Has God forgotten to be gracious? The answer, of course, is a resounding no. God has not forgotten. And whether you're here today, one that is converted, or one that is not converted as yet, God has not forgotten. His arms today are open wide. As the father in the prodigal, waiting for your return. And may you run then to the one that is not forgotten. And the prodigal, for a long time, had forgotten about the father. The father never forgot the prodigal. May you run to those waiting arms today. Run afresh to God's grace. May the Lord take his word and bless it to my hearts. We'll turn, please, in closing to 657. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn and broad. Lead me. To Calvary. We'll sing verses 1 and verse 5, verses 1 and 5, as we close and remaining standing for closing.
and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 